Well, good morning, church family. Good to be back with you. It was so much fun. Appreciate a little bit of a, a, a break this last week. I um, was at a conference in Chicago, and then last weekend got to worship at a, uh, a church that I just kind of followed their work, and it was so cool to worship at their church in Chicago, be there with Erica. But, of course, always better to be back here with my own church family. So let me ask a question today. Uh, anybody in the house or watching online, I guess you could put in the chat, that's me, that's me, that's me. But uh, anybody else in the house? slightly perfectionist like you like things to be just right and you kind of struggle to know when to say it's good and to stop any anybody else okay good few hands few hands good good um, it's good that you can admit it the worst kind of perfectionist oh we're getting some help over here with some friends to all right good 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 uh, yeah a little, little bit of love um, anybody else anybody in the room uh, just a little bit of a control freak like, you need things to be just right, and you like everything to be just right, and if it doesn't, you get slightly anxious, okay? Few people, few people, okay, good, we're being honest today. Anybody else in the room, highly competitive? If you're in it, oh, there we got a, all right, okay, there we go. We got a bunch of highly competitive folks, all right? I can be, I've discovered about something about myself. If I'm playing a game and I just know I'm not going to win, I'm not highly competitive. I just don't even try. But if there's a chance that I can win, oh man, competitive, competitive. See, I thought we were done with our conversation about talking about living under pressure, how to be strong when you feel so weak. But a couple weeks ago, I went back and I read through all of your responses that you guys emailed in when we asked you the question in week one, what weighs you down? What are the pressures that weigh you down? And I realized there was a couple of common answers that we never really addressed. I saw a whole bunch of folks um, who, who texted back responding to what weighs you down is the pressure to be perfect. What weighs you down is the pressure to influence the people around you, to make everyone around you happy. A lot of people in, in, texted in about the pressure to influence their kids or their grandkids in the right direction and especially to follow Jesus and that pressure really weighs you down. As I thought and I prayed and I'm like, all of these, they, they, they're, they're, whether it's perfectionism or trying to influence others, um, they, they really have something in common, Right? In the, that I read and heard in there that a lot of us feel some kind of pressure to control things that we just can't control, but how do we influence when we can't control? How do we force people to change and how do we live up to even our own unrealistic expectations? All of these, they all have one thing in common. That's what we're going to talk about today. And lucky for us, God knows we struggle with these things. And so in his word, we find some instruction and some encouragement. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 3 today. So Philippians chapter 3, well, I'm just going to read the first couple of verses, and then I'm going to explain a little bit about some of the background here. So the Apostle Paul writes, further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write these same things to you again, and it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs. You're like, what? Wild dogs running around the streets of Philippi? And Paul thought it was, like, important. Okay, that, you didn't think that was funny. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his spirit, we who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. So the book of Philippians is this short letter written by the Apostle Paul to some followers of Jesus living in the Roman colony of Philippi. He had gone through there on early, earlier journeys. In fact, in Acts chapter 16, we read the story. If you've never read the story, it's super fascinating. Um, he meets some, some women who are gathered down by the river to pray because there were so few Jewish people in the town <clears throat> that they didn't even have enough to have a proper synagogue. And so they would gather for a place of prayer. And he tells them about Jesus. And a whole bunch of them said, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Um, he, he sets free a, a, a girl who has been trafficked into fortune telling because she kind of has this spiritual ability to kind of hear from spirits and so they manipulate her, they use her to make money as she tells people's fortunes and, 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 and Paul casts that evil spirit out of her and sets her free. That lands them in jail in local in town and in this miraculous incident, the jailer comes to know Jesus. His whole family comes to know Jesus. His whole family is baptized out in the courtyard the next day. It's this amazing story of God working in the city of Philippi. 
Paul moves on and he writes back to them some encouragement and here he says, look guys, I want to give you some encouragement. We have no confidence in the flesh. He's writing from prison another time that he's in jail, chained to prison guards. He says, guys, remember, we have no confidence. What, what is this all about, this no confidence in the flesh? Well, here's, here's the short version, okay? The first generation of Jesus followers, they were all Jewish. They had been raised Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. They were all Jewish, right? Which means that they lived according to the ways of God revealed in the Old Testament. Not just like the Ten Commandments and the like moral laws for how to treat people, but also the kosher food rules and how to eat just the right food, which also then came with a bunch of the traditions about hand washing and proper, just to keep everything proper. And it was, a, I mean, it's a hard way of life, lots of rules. They, they, they had, like, the Sabbath was Saturday, not the first day of the week on Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. There were some very specific religious festivals that they had to honor and to celebrate. And as a sign that you were a follower of the covenant revealed in the Old Testament, all of the men were circumcised as a sign of the covenant. Well, then the good news of Jesus spread, okay? So first generation of Jesus followers, they're Jewish, and they're followers of Jesus. We might call that like messianic Judaism because they believe Jesus was the Messiah. And, but, but then, as the good news of Jesus begins to spread, and it spread outside of the area of Israel and kind of across the Mediterranean basin, a whole bunch of people start hearing about Jesus who were not Jewish. They were not raised Jewish. They, they, they maybe have heard about Judaism, or maybe they were kind of attracted to it, but never had really like converted all the way to become Jewish. And so, Unlike the first generation of Jesus followers, most of the second generation of Jesus followers, they were Christians, they were followers of Jesus, but they were not Jewish. And this brought some conflict, right? Because to be Jewish meant you had a whole way of life to live and to honor God, especially as in the Old Testament. So there was some conflict. And they had to figure it out. Paul and Peter, James, John, the other disciples and leaders and apostles, they had to, they had to figure this out. Like, if someone comes and chooses to follow Jesus... Because Jesus was Jewish and everybody else was Jewish, like, do they also, do they have to be baptized and convert to Judaism? Which, for a male, even an adult male, meant you had to be circumcised. A little bit painful, right? Okay, nobody thought that. Okay, no jokes today. Nobody's laughing at anything. We're, jokes are over. All right, just keep on going. That was an uncomfortable one. I get it, so. <laughs> Didn't know. And the church leaders concluded, No. To follow Jesus, it is simply trust in Jesus, period. That when Jesus died on the cross, he did everything required to bring us back to God. Now, we believe in Jesus. We have faith in Jesus. We obey Jesus. It doesn't mean we just get to do whatever we want and like all of the morals and rules, like no, there are no rules. No, if Jesus says do it, that becomes the rule to do it. And Jesus said a lot about how we should live, but like... To follow Jesus, Jesus is enough. You don't have to convert to Judaism. Now, they said, we're gonna, we're, let's help each other out. There, there are some ways that we can respect each other so we can all enjoy fellowship at the table together and not disrespect each other. And so, in the church in Philippi, the jailer, he loves Jesus. He's serving Jesus. He's not living by kosher food laws. He's following Jesus. He never got circumcised, didn't need to. He's obeying Jesus, trusting in Jesus, following in Jesus. Well, there were some Jewish folks who didn't believe in Jesus. And they thought all of the Jesus followers were heretics, were believing in a lie, and they were trying to wipe out Jesus followers. They didn't like this. This Jesus, they did not accept he was a son of God. He was a fraud, right? And so some Jewish folks would go, and they had gone to the city of Philippi, and this was kind of a strategy they would use all over in these little cities. They'd go into the cities, they'd find the Jesus followers, and they'd say, hey, 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 how can you call yourself a follower, a believer in God, and not obey God? The, the unclean and clean food rules given in the Old Testament. What's wrong with you? Don't you know? You can't honor God if, if God said it. Are you, are you circumcised? No. Well, how can you do that? Are you obeying Sabbath? You're worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday? What's wrong with you? Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? And these brand new followers of Jesus, and I don't know if exactly the jailer fell for it, but some of the followers of Jesus, they fell for it. They got worried. Like, uh -oh, uh oh maybe I'm not right with God. Maybe there's more I need to do, more rules that need to be followed. Paul, did you not tell me about all the rules that you're supposed to follow? And so he writes here. He says, look, 
We are the people who put no confidence in the flesh. And in the flesh, the phrase in the flesh becomes a metaphor for living by your own strength and ability. And so to have confidence in the flesh becomes this really interesting metaphor for spiritual scorekeeping. In other words, how do I know that I'm right with God? How do I know that I go to heaven when, my sins are, when, when, when I die? How do I know that my sins are forgiven? How do I know? And he says, well, the old way was to keep a score, but that's like in the flesh. Paul says, now look, I can play that game. If you want to play the game of like confidence in the flesh, living in the flesh, and scorekeeping, spiritual scorekeeping, I can play that game. Look, and so he goes on. Verse 4, though I myself, I have reasons for such confidence. I can win the game in keeping score. Here's my, he, and here's his score, right? He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, that they've earned points with God, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. As soon as you could be circumcised, I was circumcised. I was of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. I can trace my lineage and ancestry all the way back to Father Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews. I've got, I've got the religious pedigree. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. I didn't just mostly obey the law, I obeyed it exactly, and I had a community of friends who would hold me to strict accountability. We added extra measures, and then we added extra measures on that just to make sure we didn't even accidentally disobey the law. And as for zeal, was I committed? I persecuted the church. As for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. He says, I obeyed everything perfectly to a T. I got the scorecard and I got all the boxes checked. You're never going to win against me. But it wasn't enough. You see, when you're trying to earn favor through your own strength, depending on the flesh, having confidence on the flesh in what you can do all on your own, I discovered a long time ago that the essential battle of perfectionism is nothing is ever enough. You just got to do a little bit more, and maybe that'll be enough. And when you do a little bit more, it's never enough. You're just never good enough, no matter how hard you try. You just never achieve enough. The project is never good enough. The painting is never good enough, so you keep painting, keep painting, keep painting, keep painting, and eventually you ruin the painting, trying to make it perfect. And in trying to make it perfect, you made it worse, and you wore yourself out. That's perfectionism. That's scorekeeping. That is trying to be right with God and yourself and people around you through the flesh, putting confidence in the flesh. It's natural. We kind of like rules because they're clear. They're, they're, they're objective. But in the end, they don't work. He says, I can play that game and win but what did I think now? What do I think now about my scorecard? Look what he says, verse 7. But whatever were gains to me in the past, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost everything. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. He says, my old scorecard that looked really good, I've crumpled it up and I've thrown it away. All those points I thought I was earning with God, nothing. I've discovered that Jesus says, Jesus says, when you trust in me, I've got the perfect scorecard that you'll never have. So why don't you trust in me and my scorecard? Trust in Jesus and find confidence in Jesus. And when you find confidence in Jesus, then you look at your own impressive scorecard and you realize it's nothing. When you find your strength in Jesus, you realize that your own strength is really pretty weak. 
So he says, I met Jesus, and I discovered a better scorecard for my life. Verse 9. The old scorecard, garbage, that I may gain Christ, and look what he says here, and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. See, now that's a vision for life. See, in the old way, the reason we keep score and the reason we keep the scorecard is because we're trying our hardest to prove to God that we're good enough, to prove to God that we're serious, to prove to God that he should love us. But the harder you try, the worse it gets. That is like trying to gain a righteousness, a, a, a feeling that I'm right, that things are right between me and God and you and the world. And it seems like the harder I try, then I try too hard. Anybody ever have a tendency to try too hard? You're like the kid who really likes that girl and he tries so hard to impress her, he tries too hard. Whew, maybe that should be one of our small group stories. Go around the room, tell about the time you tried too hard to impress a girl and how that went. <laughs> so that's what it's like trying to be right on your own. He's discovered, he says, I found a gift. The gift of Jesus makes us right. Jesus makes us right with God. And when Jesus makes us right with God, then we can be right with ourselves. And that gives us the, the breathing room to be right with others. He says, now I have a new passion. Now I have a new passion, new fuel, new energy, a new joy in life because I'm not operating by my own strength. I'm not living according to the flesh. I'm not living, I have no confidence in the flesh because I have confidence in Christ. He says, look at my new vision for life. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection, even participation in his sufferings. I'm willing to participate in his sufferings. I'm willing to become like him even in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. I'll never be able to resurrect myself from the dead, but even if I die following Christ, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in me. Amen. That's a vision for life. And so he says to the Philippians and to us and to everyone who ever is tempted to pull the scorecard out and start checking off the boxes to try to feel good about ourselves, try to reassure ourselves that I'm doing okay. He says, I've already tried the old way. And all these guys who are trying to convince you to go back to scorekeeping, don't do it. Don't do it. Throw it away and trust in Jesus. And guess what we discover? However we treat God is also how we're going to treat other people. However we act towards God is how we're going to act towards other people. And if we live by scorekeeping and trying to earn our way and trying to prove ourselves that we're good enough towards God, we're going to have scorekeeping and trying to earn our way and prove ourselves to each other. I mean, it really is the case that when you make things right with God and you learn to live by the grace of God, then you can make things right with others and the people around you. Then you can really enjoy relationships. So here's the question. Here's the question I want you to ask yourself today. When you're feeling desperate, when you're feeling under pressure, here's the question I want us all to ask. Am I depending on my strength and my ability or am I depending on the strength and the ability of God? By faith. Depending on my strength and ability, confidence in the flesh. Depending on the strength and the ability of God, faith. Well, let's, let's ask maybe some diagnostic questions here. I, I, I put the list like this, uh, kind of like a, like a complete this sentence here. You might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself. I've got, what, seven of them here. I'm just going to go quickly through each of these, and I just kind of want you to make a mental note of like, 
Does this describe me? Yes or no? Like always, never, sometimes, what, what, what might it be here? These are kind of indicators that you might be putting confidence in the flesh, your own strength, your effort, not by faith in Jesus. You might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself, number one, trying to control other people instead of simply influencing them. You know the difference? In controlling other people, they better do what you want. They better listen, and you're just going to push them as hard as you can. Influencing says, here's what I think is best. Here's what I think is right. You have to make the decision. I love you. I care for you. I support you. You get to choose. Control says, you really don't get to choose because you're not smart enough to choose the best option, and I am smart enough. You might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself refusing to give away or share responsibility. The challenge of the perfectionist says, but, but no, if it's going to be, it's up to me. If the project is going to get finished, I have to do it because all these slackers around me can't be depended on. And so I'll pretend to give some responsibility, but really I'm going to keep it all to myself. All the weight is on my shoulders because... I don't trust anyone else. Confidence in the flesh. Number three, you might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself prioritizing rules and policies over people. If you're the rule enforcer and the policy enforcer constantly, chances are you're stepping on people. And there are some places, and I get it, there's some industries, and if you're a compliance officer, I feel sorry for you, you have the worst job in the whole wide world. You definitely deserve a raise. But if in life, you find yourself as the rule enforcer, where you should be a lover of people, you might be putting confidence in the flesh. Number four, you might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself putting unrealistic expectations on other people. Raising the bar super high and they almost never live up to it. Because you really don't trust them, God, or even yourself. Confidence in the flesh. Number five, you might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself expecting perfection from yourself constantly let down. Why shouldn't I? Why didn't I? I, 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 I should, ought, must. You might be putting confidence in the flesh if you find yourself making too many commitments, unable or unwilling to say no to anybody or anything that is asked of you because you can do it. Nobody else really can. You can do it. You must do it. Similarly, though, you might be putting too much confidence in the flesh if you find yourself making no commitments. If I say yes to that, then I have to do it, and I have to do it perfectly. I don't think I can, so I'm just going to say no to everything. In the end, that's really the same thing. The person who says yes to everything and the person who says no to everything is still putting confidence in their own strength and ability, exact same thing. And the conclusion is we're depending on our own strength and ability, and here's really what I want to land at today. When we are depending on our own strength and our own ability, we become pushy with other people and we become perfectionists towards ourselves. That's why we got to talk about this today. And what I want to free you from, to release some of the pressure that you've been feeling and feeling weighed down, is maybe you just got to get honest and say, I've accepted willingly some of the pressure on myself and I've become pushy with the people around me, trying to force them to do what I want them to do. And when you get pushy with other people, chances are you're pushy towards yourself, expecting perfection. And it's not just with others and yourself, it's with God. Come on, let's get honest. I had somebody get honest with me several years ago. She said, when I look back at my parenting journey, I had to be there and I was obsessive with doing everything exactly right for my kids because I firmly believed that I could do a better job raising my kids than God could. And I'm like, wow, the first person I've ever heard to be honest about that. 
See, the reality is, the reality is, when you start to get pushy towards other people, trying to force them to do what you think they should do, in essence, you're saying, I prayed and I asked God to do it, but I don't really believe that he can or will, so I'm going to do it for him. When you get perfectionist towards yourself, you're saying, I don't really think that God can answer my prayer and give me the help and strength that I asked him for, and so I'm going to do it myself. And the solution, the solution it's simple, but it's really hard to live out, is to stop trying to force other people to conform to my opinion. Stop trying so hard to be good enough and to give grace to others and to give grace to myself. To stop trying to be in control of everything and just let God be in control. Stop trying to be in charge of everything and just let God be in charge of the world that he has created. Now you could say, if we all did this, we'd all become lazy, irresponsible, and passive. No, no, no. Look at, look at, look at, look at what Paul says here in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or that I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. This is not lazy. This is not passive. This is not irresponsible. This says I am actually responsible Responsible. I am able to respond because Jesus is the leading the way. I'm not pushing the truck here. I'm just simply following Jesus. And whatever he goes, I go. Whatever he says to do, I do. Whenever he says stop, I stop. And I'm going 100% full speed ahead until he stops and then I stop and do nothing. And if he says stop, stop trying so hard and just trust me, I stop. And then when he says, go 100 miles an hour, I go 100 miles an hour. See, that is different from confidence in the flesh, my own strength, my own ability. So I've got a challenge for you. As I thought and prayed about today, there's two specific applications I want us to consider today. And here in a little bit, I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. And I want you to be really bold. I want you to be really honest. The, the, the first group I want to talk to today as we're wrapping up things is parents or grandparents of kids who are not following Jesus. See, I hear the stories regularly of people whose hearts are breaking because your kids aren't following Jesus. Your adult children, they're walking away from Jesus and it breaks your heart. Your grandkids are walking away from Jesus and they know and they've heard the story and it breaks your heart. In this holiday season, what would it look like rather than being the pushy parent who tries to push your faith on your kids or grandkids? What would it look like to love your kids, to love your grandkids, to talk about the things they're interested in? I remember talking to a guy one time and he said, yeah, we're coming, coming for Thanksgiving and, and my father-in-law is coming over, but my kids don't like it when grandpa comes over and they say, why is grandpa only able to talk about Jesus and nothing else? That's a hard one, right? Because grandpa cares so much about you and he cares so much that you know Jesus. But they're like, yeah, but that's the only thing he knows how to talk about. And so the kids had no relationship with grandpa, didn't enjoy grandpa because grandpa was pushy with his faith. Man, that's a, that's a hard line to walk, okay? I, I, I get it, I get it. What would it look like for you today to say, God, I've been pushy. I've accepted responsibility that's really not my responsibility. And I've tried to force my faith on my kids and my grandkids. And today, God, I'm just going to have to trust you. God, I can't anymore, but I believe you can. God, I believe you can speak what my kids need to hear in a way that I'll never be able to. So I'm not going to quit and be passive, but I'm going to quit being pushy. God, I don't have to be pushy. I believe you're working in their hearts. God, I don't have to be pushy. I believe you are guiding other people to speak into their lives. Here's the question you ask yourself. Do I believe that God is in control and be, can be trusted? Or am I going to insist on doing his work for him and be pushy? In just a minute, the 
prayer team's going to come forward. We're going to pray, and I'm going to invite some parents and some grandparents of kids who are following Jesus, if that's you. I'm going to invite you today to come down and pray and make a bold proclamation to say, I'm going to start trusting in Jesus. And this Thanksgiving, this Christmas is going to be different because I'm going to stop being pushy grandma. I'm going to stop being pushy father-in-law. And I'm going to just genuinely love the people around me. And I'm going to pray really, really hard and trust Jesus. You'll experience some new freedom. How about for the perfectionists in the room who never really know if we've done enough or if we're good enough? And the solution, the practice of dealing with our own trust issues is the call to trust God. That when Jesus died on the cross, he died for me. And Jesus makes me right with God, not my own effort. And if you've been wearing yourself out, trying to be good enough for God, I'm going to invite you today to trust him and to ask a guided prayer partner to help you trust him and slow down and stop trying to earn favor with God. Stop trying to obey Jesus out of obligation or fear or earning, but to just obey Jesus in response to his love for you just because he's your king. See, I want to see some people who The enemy has gotten you down, has gotten you to doubt Jesus, the power of God, and yourself to start trusting Jesus again. So prayer team, worship team, why don't you guys come on forward? The question I want all of us to ask ourselves today, you ask yourself this, and then we're going to pray, we're going to talk to God, is this. When I'm feeling under pressure, when I'm feeling the stress of it all, am I depending on my strength and ability or on the strength and the ability of God? Bow your heads with me, let's pray. God, God, I pray would you bring us to the end of ourselves, the end of finding confidence in our own strength, our own ability. Jesus, would you teach us to trust you and to find strength in you. Jesus, I pray today that some folks would find release. As they turn kids over to you, as they turn grandkids over to you and choose to stop being pushy as we turn our own futures over to you and stop being perfectionist. Jesus, would you plant in our hearts a bold faith and ability to trust you?